So as we begin, I'd like us to pray together the prayer for peace in the Middle East. God of mercy and compassion, of grace and consolation, pour your power upon all your children in the Middle East, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Palestinians, and Israelites. Let hatred be turned into love, fear to trust, despair to hope, oppression to freedom, occupation to liberation, that violent encounters may be replaced by loving embraces, and peace and justice could be experienced by all. Amen. I don't know if you know that I'm a closeted country western fan, and I listen to it behind doors all the time. And one of my favorite uh, writers and singers is Alan Jackson. A very popular song that came out at 9-11, uh, where, would you, where were you the, when the world stopped turning? And one of the lines in the song is, I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I watch CNN, but I'm not sure if I could tell you the difference between Iraq and Iran. And I think most people can't tell the difference between Iraq and Iran. This is the Middle East that we're talking about. And we see Iraq up here, and Iran here. Syria, we've heard a whole bunch about, Turkey. This area is where Israel, Jerusalem, the Promised Land. And these days we hear a lot about Yemen. Mecca is located here. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, the main connection between Abraham, the Jews, and the Christians is. Slide one. Just a minute. Okay. Abraham is the biblical patriarch who was born and lived in 1850 BC. He had a wife by the name of Sarah, who, according to our tradition, the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition, was the one selected by God to carry on the seed and the promise that, that, that God had given Abraham. What was the promise? You, you, you let me be your God, you only worship one God, and I'll make you a people so multiplied that you can't count them, more than the stars in the heavens. And under this culture, the birth of children is ultimately the blessing from God. So he marries Sarah. Sarah can't have children. So Sarah gives her maid, Hagar, to him in intercourse, and she conceives and has a son, and they name him Ishmael. Well, after Ishmael was born, Sarah was not real happy, and somehow, through God's grace, she became pregnant, and her son was Isaac. And as soon as Isaac came on the scene, Sarah wanted Hagar gone, as well as Ishmael. So he and his mother, Hagar, are banned from this area, and they went to the mountains outside what is now Mecca. Followers of Ishmael became known as Ishmaelites. And if you look in the Bible, you'll, in the Old Testament, you will hear the references to Ishmaelites. They're not very nice people, or at least everyone treats them that way. Now there's a reason, of course. They're angry people. They remember what happened. Isaac is born. Isaac gets married. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. According to the tradition, the father gives a blessing to the oldest son, who is Esau. And Sarah didn't like that fact. She wanted Jacob. So she confused the old man, and he gave the blessing to Jacob which meant that he was no longer the chosen one to carry on the tradition. So we have two rather smitten and angry people coming from Abraham. Okay? The scriptures tell us, this is from, this is from Genesis, my other glasses. This is in reference to Ishmael and Hagar. You are now pregnant, God says to Hagar, you shall bear a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard you. God has answered you. He shall be a wild ass of a man. 
his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, in opposition to all his kin, shall he encamp. When Esau lost his heritage, it's written in Genesis, Isaac spoke again and said to him, his son Esau, Ah, far from the fertile land shall you be dwelling, far from the dew of the heavens above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother shall be served. But when you become restricted, you shall be thrown off his yoke from the neck. And Esau bore Jacob a grudge because of the blessing his father had given him. Not only were there the two descendants, direct descendants of Abraham, were rejected by their parents, but it just happens that Hagar and Ishmael have a, a daughter that marries Esau's son. Bad blood. <laughs> bad, bad, bad blood. So for, for generations, they not only fought each other, they fought everybody else. All right? Ishmael, Ishmaelites. Mohammed is a direct descendant of Abraham and Hagar. Abraham is the, the father of the chosen people. As, as we believe, it's from that particular branch that eventually Jesus' uh, uh, lineage comes from. Um, Mohammed doesn't, isn't considered um, a god. He's, he's considered a prophet. Adam and, Adam and Abraham are the first prophets in the line of Muhammad, and Muhammad is the last prophet. So there are no more prophets born after uh, Muhammad. So all of those that came before are prophets. We believe Abraham is the father of the chosen people, the Jewish people, and the father of we in the Christian uh, tradition. Muslims follow the religion Islam, which means submission. Muhammad was born um, in 570. Lots went on in the church and in Jewish life before 570. But by the time 570 came, he proclaimed that he was the one in 570 to, to have a vision from the angel Gabriel who appeared to him and revealed his preaching in the city of Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia. The basics of, of their religion, God is one, a complete surrender, that's what Islam means, and, and it's the only acceptable thing, God, and they call their God Allah. The Qumran is the central religious text of Islam. Uh, it's, it's verbally revealed to Muhammad by God through Gabriel. So what we see in, in, the, in their book um, is what he interprets that Gabriel told him. By the time Muhammad dies in 632, 40,000 followers, today there's 1.6 billion. Today we have 350 million Buddhists, we have 2.1 billion Christians, and 1 billion Hindus, and then it goes down to all kinds of things. Over the course of 300 years, um, Muslim religion grew in huge numbers because they began to invade other countries, uh, wiping out both Jews and Christians. You saw Yemen before as that little country down in the bottom. Yemen at this time was almost 100% Jewish. And so eventually what had happened is he chased them all out and established mosques everywhere. Um, want to go on to the next? Oh, let's go back one more time. Sorry. Um, especially when Jerusalem was taken over, there was no major threat to impact the local culture. But when Jerusalem was overcome, and we know about that because we know of the Crusades, which went there to liberate Jerusalem. When, when it became a threat to most religions, then they, they started the Crusade thing and chased them out, and kind of kept them quiet and by themselves for a long, long time. There was no local culture being changed once they were released. What are the things that Muslims believe? They call them the, next slide please, they call them the five pillars of Islam. They pray five times a day, facing Mecca, um, the longest standing mosque, by the way, in the United States is in Cedar Rapids. 
Bet you didn't know that. It was built in 1934. Don Usher said it was right across the street from where he grew up. They used to play it in that yard. Alms giving, giving is, they give 2.5% of their income. There's fasting, Ramadan, observed in the daylight hours for a month. So they go from, uh, as soon as the sun comes up, there's fasting, there's nothing. When the sun goes down, they party and start drinking and whatever. But the fast is very, very seriously taken by Muslims. Every Muslim has to go at least once in a lifetime to Mecca. They call that, they call that the Hajjah, to go to Mecca. And there is no other God but Allah. Jihad is the religious duty of Muslims struggling against those who do not recognize Allah. It's a physical struggle against the enemy, and, and it can be violent and it can be nonviolent. There are basically two different denominations or sects of, of Muslims. Uh, we, have, we have sects in the, in the Jewish tradition. We have sects, of course, in the Christian tradition. What are our Christian sects? S-E-C-T-S. -E Presbyterians, Lutherans, Catholics. Got it? All right. There are two basic denominations and sects in, in Muslim. At the death of Muhammad in 632, there was a power control over who would inherit the political and religious office. The majority, 80% of them, were Sunnis. They wanted Muhammad's successor to be chosen by the community of followers, something like we elect our pope by, by gathering together to select. The Shiites wanted the leadership to stay within the prophet's family, 20% today. Sunni follow only what Muhammad taught and wrote. Shia says that ayatollahs can re be a reflection of God on earth. We've had ayatollahs for years and years. We remember that phrase. They are, they are people who are leaders of Muslims uh, from different countries and different places. They're not recognized by lots of Muslims. Others do. They both have a history of oppressing each other, and both are, are militant. There are militant and radical groups. Put all of this on the back burner for a moment. As with every other religion, Muslims, there are several political and social philosophies. A, uh, next one. Go too far. I'll go through. There we are. Muslims are of several political and social philosophies. They're conservatives. The Qumran must be followed fundamentally. Everything the book says. We have fundamental Christians who believe the same thing about the Bible. The liberals, the, the Qumran can be meddled down to adapt to modern society, where women don't have to wear veils, they can't pray five times a day, so maybe they fast a little, but not all the time. And different groups of Jews are the same way, different groups of Christians, some of us think if we go to church twice a year, that's good enough, uh, and, and you know, that's what's happening. And of course, the conservatives of any of our faiths do not tolerate that and won't. The innovators of the, there's also the innovators of the nation of Islam, those are black Muslims, anti-whites, which were formed in our country, have nothing to do with, we, we, know, we know some of that, don't we? In the United States, uh, they're, they're fighting against um, white people, period. Next slide. What is a fundamentalist, or what is fundamentalism? Fundamentalism is five basic fundamentals. The Bible is literal, the virgin birth of Jesus, Jesus' death atoned for sin, the body, bodily resurrection of Jesus, the historical reality of Jesus' miracles. A fundamental Christian believes only in the fundamentals, nothing else. Radical fundamentalist Christians may not shoot anybody, but get pretty close, people who bomb abortion clinics, people who have marched at military funerals, who come from this crazy fundamentalist group in Kansas that think that all war is a result of homosexuality. Those are fundamentalist Christians who only believe in the fundamentals. We are not fundamentalist Catholics. We believe in all kinds of other things. 
the authority of the Holy Father, the working of the Holy Spirit in our communities. We believe in the sacraments. Fundamentalist Christians won't necessarily follow any of them. ISIS, therefore, the next slide, is an extreme, radical, fundamentalist group, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Not only claims religious and political and military authority over all Muslims, but project an ideology to achieve a new world order and to affect cultures by means including violence and mass murder. Characterized by its contempt and hatred of beliefs and practices and symbols of other religious tr traditions, ISIS is a Sunni militant group, also known as Al-Qaeda, founded by Osama bin Laden and several others in 1988. Most Muslims do not recognize ISIS, and most of us don't know the difference. Do we? They all look alike. When you see somebody wearing that woman with that thing over, we think they're all alike. All Muslims are suspect, aren't they? Has anyone read the Quran? You, you, can, you can Google it, uh, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Google uh, Quran in English, clear and easy to read. There are 140, they don't call them chapters, there are 140 of they call surahs. Repeated verses throughout the Quran, they're talking about God's forgiveness, talks about mercy, it talks about make peace between people, it talks about God is mighty and wise, God is healing and knowing. It addresses similar things as our Bible does about divorce, about gambling, about drunkenness, the lending of money and sexual practices. There are numerous references in the Quran, figures of the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, even Jesus, the son of Mary, is talked about in the Quran. The quotes that I want us to look at that are probably interpreted by fundamentalists, those who believe and do good deeds of these are quotes similar to the Bible. Those who believe and do good deeds and pray regularly, give, give to charity, they will have rewards. There will be no fear and they shall not grieve. Or we believe in God and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, and what was given to Moses and Jesus and the prophet from their Lord. But verse 4 in Surah 3, to note... Do not, do not consider those killed in the cause of God as dead. In fact, they are alive at their Lord, and He will provide. If you were a fundamentalist, radical Muslim, what would that tell you? If you're killed in the cause of God, great things will happen. Verse 170, delighting in what God has given them out of His grace, happy for those who have not yet joined them, they have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. You know? 171, they rejoice in grace from God and bounty, and that God will not waste the reward of the faithful. 172, those who respond to God and the messenger despite the persecution they have suffered, for the virtuous and the pious among them, there is a great reward. Those are the only four verses that one can take out of context in a radical way and justify what's going on. There is so much violence, particularly against established religion, Christians particularly, and of course Jews. There are no Jews and Christians left in some of those places. They've all either been killed or run out and it's still happening. That's still happening today. Let's go back to the map. What adds to this whole issue is the fact what is so important to the world about this area? Oil. 
Whoever controls this area can control the world. Particularly when you get to Yemen, which has this particular entry in and out of the sea, the Dead Sea. How, how important that is for those who want control. There's hardly anything left in Yemen that's Christian or Jewish. And if you're part of ISIS, the more you can control and kill, the better. 